Track 4. In the 30s, Oriental pearls were suffering from two bad blows, the Depression and Japanese-cultured pearls. In Europe and America, purchases of luxuries had been greatly reduced. Even the rich considered it bad taste to wear jewels, because it aroused resentment. But at least the jewelers believed the Depression would pass. A more permanent threat came to Oriental pearls when the Japanese discovered that a piece of sand inserted between the shells of a living oyster caused an irritation and produced a cultured pearl, indistinguishable to the naked eye from the natural Oriental pearl. The introduction of the cultured pearl caused consternation in the Isle of Pearls, Bahrain, among the pearl dealers and among the owners of Oriental pearls. It broke the price of Oriental pearls. A New York pearl wholesaler, Albert Krolik, came to us on behalf of the pearl merchants for help. They were an elite in the jewelry trades. They dealt with retailers like Cartier, who accepted pearls on consignment from them or bought pearls from them outright, pearls that came into the market from Bahrain, Indian Rajas, or from forced sale due to the Depression. We were to start a countervailing movement to meet both challenges, the cultured pearl and the Depression. First, I gathered facts about pearls, the history, myths, economics, and fashion. Then a Bureau for Natural Pearl Information distributed news, feature articles, and talks about pearls. Then we engaged the Mellon Institute of Pittsburgh to make a scientific research to identify the differences between natural oriental and cultured pearls. They found out that the cultured pearl, under an X-ray, showed a grain of sand. The true oriental did not. Scientific American in April and May 1935 ran articles about them by Dr. A. E. Alexander, the researcher, which we distributed widely. At least the X-ray test gave Oriental Pearl owners a psychic satisfaction in knowing they possessed the true Oriental Pearl. I thought that stressing the origin of the Oriental Pearl, the Isle of Pearls and the Persian Gulf, might help us. The Sheikdom of Bahrain, an archipelago of 14 small islands, was about 50 miles across. Pearl beds were found around the shoals and in the deep water between islands. I had run across the Bahrain Petroleum Company, a subsidiary of the California Texas Oil Company, in my reading. It had negotiated a concession for newly discovered oil in that part of the world with the Sheik of Bahrain through its representative, M. W. Thornburg. I thought this new development, linked with pearls, might focus attention on our jewel. I visited Mr. Thornburg, who was just thinking of his yearly gift to the Sheik, a present of some sort, from time to time, simply as a mark of friendship and appreciation for his helpfulness. He had decided a 55-foot cruiser with a 14-foot beam, a 3-foot draft, powered with a 150-horsepower Stirling diesel engine, was ideal for the Sheik. I mentioned its publicity value to Oriental Pearls, and Mr. Thornburg let me handle the story of the gift. I now broached to Mr. Thornburg my idea of bringing the Sheik of the Isle of Pearls to the United States and asked him to defray some of the expenses. Mr. Thornburg was agreeable, and introduced me by letter to C. Dalrymple, Belgrave, Esquire, CBE, British advisor to the Bahrain government. If Oriental pearls were known and understood, I wrote, the island's economy would be helped. We could link the sheik and pearls, and the American people would know the difference. I suggested that a high dignitary or member of the ruling family come to the United States. Americans like to make a fuss over royalty. Some recent arrivals, I said, had created great interest, the Queen of Romania, the King of Siam, the Swedish Crown Prince, the Raja of Indore, the Rani of Sarawak. If we dramatize the romance of the islands through such a dignitary, appreciation for Oriental pearls might be developed. In June 1939, Mr. Belgrave notified me that His Highness Sheikh Sir Hamad had given permission to his eldest brother, Sheikh Mohammed bin Isa al Khalifa, to visit America, and specifically the World's Fair in New York, accompanied by his interpreter. Sheikh Mohammed, he told me, was sixty, had traveled extensively in the East, in Europe, and England. He was a man of some education, had a reputation as a poet, was interested in history, and was an expert on the Khalifa family. A big landowner, he was keen about agriculture, which in Bahrain meant date cultivation. The Sheikh arrived at the Waldorf with his interpreter and servants. He had a stringy beard and looked like Ibn Saud without glasses. He wore Arab robes, a magnificent turban, and a bejeweled dagger attached to a belt around his middle. Young Yatim, the interpreter, told me his family was at odds with the sheikh's family. He was an emergency substitute for a regular retainer who was halted at a quarantine station in Egypt because of trachoma, 
and therefore could not accompany the sheik's brother to the United States. Young Yatim told me of the great influence American periodicals had in Arabia, and in impeccable English he asked me whether he could visit the library of Time and see the map room. Time, he said, had better maps of Bahrain and its harbors than any in Bahrain. Together we poured over maps at Nine Rockefeller Plaza, thousands of miles away from his home. He was thrilled to find places, streets, and other data he could not find in maps in Bahrain, and he gained great respect for America. During his tour of the World's Fair, the Sheik reviewed troops at the Federal Building, visited the Lebanon Pavilion, and met Pierre Cartier at the House of Jewels. The Bahrain Petroleum Company gave a dinner in his honor. The press and press photographers attended a conference with him. He took a boat trip around Manhattan, and on Sunday I took him and your team to the Century Country Club in White Plains. After a walk around the swimming pool to admire the flowers, I suggested that the sheik take his customary siesta, while Yatim and I sat at the edge of the pool. After an hour's sleep, the sheik left the clubhouse and walked toward us. I rose to greet him. The interpreter remained reclining on the grass, a demonstration of his family's enmity toward the sheik. The sheik quickened his step, and I saw a storm of anger on his face. As he moved closer, his right hand grasped his jeweled dirk, I ran to the sheik and made a motion as if to catch his right hand, poised near the dirk in his belt. The lightning and thunder on his face disappeared instantly. The sheik instead muttered horrifying imprecations in Arabic. After a few moments he cooled off, as pleasant as usual. He would have thought little about executing his interpreter for not showing respect. I did not court publicity about this episode. He enjoyed the World's Fair, admired our bridges and tunnels, reacted appropriately to high buildings and museums. Nightlife lured him to the International Night Club at 49th Street and Broadway. When I called for him that evening, he was dressed in a tuxedo purchased for the occasion. At the nightclub, an eager press agent attempted to get him to pose with twelve chorus girls, but he promptly declined. His interpreter explained that this would be an impossible picture. What would his wives in Bahrain think? We hustled him out of the nightclub before any chorus girls succeeded in sidling up to him. The evening I took him to a musical comedy, he confided to me that it was too much for him. The French proverb says, A man is not made of wood. He bolted and never saw it through, but motorcycle escorts and press conferences pleased him. The Pearl Associates gave a luncheon in honor of Sheikh Mohammed bin Isa al-Khalifa. John Powers sent three of his loveliest girls to model pearls, and they wore afternoon dinner and formal evening attire with their necklaces. We took fashion pictures of the Sheikh acceptable to his wives, with the beautiful models and their pearl necklaces. Walter F. Weiner, my nephew, then took him to Hyde Park to visit President Roosevelt, and reported a friendly, sympathetic meeting, duly chronicled in the press. Before he left, His Highness gave me a supply of his photographs to send to those who had given him hospitality. Mr. Cartier characteristically responded, The photograph will be hung in a prominent place, together with other documents commemorating important events. On August 9, 1939, laden with gifts, he left. He bade farewell to the country at a final press interview on the boat, and gave me his photograph with an Arabic inscription, a quotation from the Koran, which he said expressed his philosophy, Love, Truth, Love. The sheikh and I liked each other. Often we communicated without talking, for I did not know Arabic, nor he English. Even when the interpreter wasn't in the room, I understood him from his manner, smile, facial expression. Despite his accustomed tent life and feasting on the ground, he took to the comforts of the Waldorf Tower as if he had enjoyed them all his life, and was to continue to. Once more I was struck with the fact that despite their lack of experience with mass communications and publicity, foreign visitors immediately understood them, as if the winning of public attention was instinctive and not an acquired characteristic. Maybe this desire to satisfy the ego through other people's knowledge and appreciation is so tied up with basic drives that it jumps national barriers and boundaries. Everybody responds to my public. At home, I'm sure the sheik didn't give a damn about the mob, the hoi polloi, but here he acted like an accomplished movie star. I received a cable on his departure which thanked me for my assistance during his pleasant visit to America in the interests of Bahrain pearls, and which ended with salams. In 1939, the companies most responsive to public relations usually faced a crisis. They wanted a medicine man to cure their ills. The respected First National Bank told me a client needed help. The United States government wanted to split the Pullman Company into two separate companies, a manufacturing company that made the cars 
and a service company that leased parlor and sleeping cars to the railroads and serviced them with Pullman porters. The company was a monopoly because it made its cars and serviced them, and monopolies were contrary to law. One folklore of capitalism is that in such an action the company is always right and the government always wrong. An antitrust suit is usually treated as a sign of the government's drift toward the left, rather than the breaking of the law by a private enterprise. In Chicago, I made my final business arrangements with the president of the Pullman Company, a Mr. Crawford, a former school teacher, in a huge office overlooking Michigan Boulevard in Lake Michigan, the embodiment of the American dream. This gentle soul, who looked as if he had just stepped out of a high school mathematics classroom, was running a tight, lucrative monopoly. Of course, this was before airplane travel completely deflated Pullman travel. He asked me to make a study of Pullman Incorporated, the holding company, the Pullman Company, the service corporation, and Pullman Standard Incorporated, the company that manufactured parlor and sleeping cars, so we might recommend a program to get the public to understand the social values of the company so that it would support the company in the critical situation it faced. I don't think I ever plunged into as deep an ocean of facts and figures. The railroad industry was government-controlled on a national and a state level, and there were facts on every facet of it. The study turned out to be so voluminous that I had it bound in a huge volume in red suede hard covers. We analyzed the relationship of each of the companies with their multiple publics, and we tried to identify the problems associated with each of these relationships. We made recommendations for each of the problems in each of the categories identified. We covered promotion for the Pullman Company to increase its Pullman business, and compared its promotion with that of its competitors. We outlined efforts to encourage pleasure travel in the United States and recommended changes in Pullman car construction. We stressed the need for better heating and ventilation. We urged that industrial designers beautify car interiors. People talked of early Pullman in a derogatory way. Since the first Pullman parlor car had been built decades before, no one had bothered with specific statistics about the physical structure of the average American. Parlor car seats were made as they had been made. When I presented my idea that seats be made to fit the American body, it was not looked on with much favor. The Pullman Company paid my fee, but never, as far as I know, adopted even one of my recommendations. It stuck to its traditional methods. The government won its suit, and the company was cut in two, each going its separate way. I did not feel too bad. I had long since learned that even in a crisis... An individual who heads a company wants to preserve his own identity and usually takes advice only if it coincides with his preconceived ideas. Late one night in December 1938, I picked up my ringing telephone and heard a voice yelling, This is A.P. I want to talk to Mr. Bernays. Who is A.P.? I asked. The voice repeated noisily, A.P., A.P., A.P. I asked, are you the Associated Press or the Atlantic and Pacific Tea Company? No, the voice answered curtly. I am A.P. Giannini. I'm in San Francisco. Please take the next plane and see me at the bank. This was my introduction to the chairman of the board of the Bank of America. I continued, Is this a professional call? His voice answered, Yes, it is. Please take the next plane to San Francisco. We want to retain you. I don't fly. Very well, he said. Take the next train. I named a fee, and added, I'll let you know in a few days whether I can come, and when. The next day I asked several bankers about Giannini. I wanted to be sure of the character of the man before I tied up with him. Several financial writers said he did business in an unconventional way, that he was a vigorous, rugged individualist. Some added a few unprintable adjectives and epithets. One man told me that Giannini was a member of the board of the highly respected National City Bank of New York. The mixed reports intrigued me. If the bankers of the National City Bank accepted him as a board member, I figured I could accept him, too. Bank of America had grown with California's expansion in the 20s, mainly by absorption of other banks. It had 492 branch banks in California alone. Banks in neighboring states were controlled by Transamerica Corporation, its subsidiary. Bank of America was the largest American bank outside New York City, the fourth largest in the United States, and the ninth largest in the world, its loans and discounts were greater than those of any other bank in the United States. 
No other bank had as much money in outstanding loans in FHA, or as great an amount in savings accounts, or operated so many branches. No other bank had so many depositors, 2,200,000 or one out of every three persons in California, or had so many stockholders. Giannini was ruthless when someone stood in his way. A.P., I am sure, felt no personal qualms about conducting his bank in this way. He felt that whatever he did was right. His unconventional banking methods introduced many new collateral services, from installment buying of household equipment and automobiles to issuing traveler's checks. His economic power gave him influence in California's political, industrial, and agricultural structure. As loans increased during the Depression, more power flowed into his hands. He became the dominant figure in California. After preliminaries, A.P. got down to business with me. He wanted me to handle the bank's public relations. The Securities and Exchange Commission, a relatively new regulatory body of the government, had brought charges against Transamerica Corporation because it owned stock in banks in more than one state. The SEC stated this was contrary to law. Hearings were to be held in Washington. If there was an unfavorable verdict, the SEC would delist the stock from exchanges under SEC supervision. AP made no bones about challenging the government. He had successfully challenged the state and won out in California. He told me it was essential that the Bank of America increase, not diminish, ownership of banks in other states to keep pace with the phenomenal growth of the West. The SEC complaint, in 21 bristling pages, charged violation of the law against interstate bank holdings and alleged there were 18 faulty items in the bank's financial reports. The Commission wanted to delve into transactions between the bank and its subsidiaries, which controlled vast enterprises stretching from California to Portland, Oregon, including fire insurance, life insurance, mortgage, and real estate companies. The government was engaged in social reform, and Giannini, as a symbol of the big private enterpriser of the pre-New Deal days, was a natural target. He acted in banking like the aggressive pioneers who had built the West. He evaluated his actions by expedience, not by moral standards. He was an old-time individualist, or believer in free enterprise in the late 19th century sense. George W. Hill, another such character, seemed pale by comparison. As Giannini continued to talk, I realized he considered himself successful and overpowering. I believed the temper of the times was responsible in part for the government attack on Giannini. The pendulum had swung from the laissez-faire policy of the 70s and 80s. FDR's New Deal was calling for a vigorous fight against what Justice Brandeis had called the curse of bigness. But Giannini did not and could not understand the legal or ideological basis for the attack. He had such overwhelming faith in himself that he was quite willing to try to dominate the policies of the United States and direct the will of its people. I recognized the dangers of this emotional approach, particularly if Giannini used his money to try to control political power. A democratic society has to protect itself against these dangers. I thought these matters over as he talked, deciding the part I should justifiably take in his battles. First I defined my function to him. I was no attorney, I said. I could not interpret statutes or judge the legal aspects of his case. I could advise on the strategies and tactics necessary to ensure that the public heard his side of the story. I could tell the public about the social advantages inherent in his mass credit methods. I might even draw public attention to certain broad issues his case might arouse. Are there only disadvantages in bigness? What should the size of a private enterprise be in order to serve the public? What were the implications for the democratic process and justice of an administrative agency, the SEC, that was judge, jury, and prosecuting attorney, rolled into one. I spent several days in cram sessions with high bank officials to familiarize myself with the Washington case. Then I returned to New York, prepared to go to the hearings. In Washington, at the Mayflower Hotel, AP prepared to throw the gauntlet down to the United States. He introduced me to the members of a large delegation that had accompanied him from the West Coast, and occupied almost an entire wing on one floor of the huge hotel. There were San Francisco attorneys, most of them Italian-Americans who had grown up with A.P., and, like himself, now had status and wealth. Vice presidents, assistant vice presidents, their assistants, secretaries, and clerks. Several New York attorneys added cachet to the party. Giannini had also retained, for the duration, some Washington attorneys. Living and working at the Mayflower with this group, was like a place at GHQ while a great battle was being fought. 
Giannini's historic battle against the SEC took place in the old Department of Commerce building. Here the Commission carried on its quasi-legal proceedings with lawyers for the bank, sworn witnesses, attorneys for the U.S., and a trial examiner. Precedents in judicial procedure were disregarded, and the trial examiner, the judge in the case, and the prosecuting attorney, O. John Roggi, were all members of the same agency. But the real case was being fought in the arena of the entire United States through the newspapers. The hearing room was only a platform for the participants to talk to the larger audience outside. The hearing room often became a shambles. The participants interrupted one another. Subjects were not pursued to their clothes, and personal vituperation was commonplace. Raggi often had difficulty in making his points in the noisy hearing room. But when his arguments did not seem to carry, his emotions did. I could not help wonder, as I watched government attorneys presenting their case, whether professional zeal dominated their actions, or whether they were functioning to gain goodwill with a sympathetic public, or possibly to show how forceful they were, and thus get themselves more secure and better paid jobs outside the government. A.P. led the battle, egging on his attorneys. Occasionally he jumped into the fray himself. We held a nightly war council at the hotel after dinner, and planned strategy for the next day. A.P. led the discussions, which were punctuated by excited shouts, expostulations, waving of arms and hands, heated discussions, and name-calling. Giannini especially enjoyed these verbal battles, and acted as if this were one of the pleasures of the banking business. I never had heard such agitated, personal, but friendly discussion in business. It was exciting, wondering what would happen next. Would they come to blows? Was their apparent anger real? Of course there was no physical violence. This was their way of letting off steam, to rid themselves of the tensions of the day. Giannini himself was acting as he did when he was fighting his way up in the Italian section of San Francisco and in the outer reaches of the western states. It was surprising to me that the U.S. government should be using publicity as a weapon instead of relying on the law alone to win this case. For that is what was done. When headlines favorable to us appeared in the late afternoon Washington editions of the newspapers, the SEC attorneys rushed statements about the case to the morning newspapers to kill any favorable impression. This happened more than once, a part of the zealous spirit of the New Deal. The SEC hearings on the application to delist Transamerica stock were adjourned on March 28th, after the Transamerica Corporation had offered the SEC full access to its books and records and those of its subsidiaries. Then unexpectedly, the news tickers carried a story that the federal court in California had filed a suit against the Bank of America and its subsidiary, Time Trust Incorporated, in joining it from selling Time Trust securities to the public. This surprise publicity attack was undoubtedly time to deflate the Bank of America in the public mind. Naturally, El Mario, the bank's president, was sore. He issued a statement in New York, through me, that he would not allow himself to be intimidated by pressure politics and government by headlines. He said he had offered the SEC the books and records of Transamerica and regarded time trust certificates as sound, desirable investments. He welcomed the opportunity of appearing in court to prove the validity of his actions and the strength of his securities. He deplored these rearguard surprise actions of publicity as uncalled for, unnecessary, and inconsistent with any reasonable activity to safeguard the public interest. He protested the willful, deliberate sabotage of financial institutions, and said it was contrary to our basic judicial system for a government body to level false accusations and seek widespread publicity by surprise methods, without simultaneously offering an opportunity to the accused to present his side to the public. Usually statements of the counter-offensive did not make the same newspaper editions that carry the original government accusation, which I think the SEC was fully aware of, and which was part of the strategy. In this case, forewarned by a ticker service, the morning papers carried our side of the story, too. Still, I felt this was an injustice, and suggested to A.P. that he take the offensive against publicity tactics of the government. He needed no urging. He was ready to take on the SEC. I wrote a statement for him, which received widespread comment and publicity. Giannini vigorously attacked government by headlines in this statement. He said in it that he had come to Washington expecting to find justice dominating the hearing rooms. Instead, the New Dealers used impropaganda to make up for their lack of experience. He deplored the fact that in a government in which the judiciary, legislative, and executive branches were separate and distinct, the prosecuting attorney judge and witnesses should all be employees of the same unit of government, 
and he expressed hope that an awakened public opinion would bring back the basics of America. The case was getting nationwide attention. It would set a precedent and define the relations of a private business organization to its government. It also upheld the democratic principle that a man could challenge his government's actions and depend on due process of law for justice. A.P. was affirming a principle, but I do not believe he was fighting for principles. Anger, egoism, and possessiveness motivated him, along with a pioneer spirit that suggested anyone could get what he went after. From May to October 1939, fifteen accountants from the SEC examined the Bank of America books, but they uncovered nothing of importance. In the final adjudication, the bank was allowed to keep Transamerica, though the two later became independent of each other. The case helped establish the government's right to examine private business and to publicize its findings. Private business was public business. The findings did not affect the methods of the Bank of America or its continued growth. I studied the issues and planned the production and distribution of press material presenting the Bank of America side. I worked with the Giannini's on the strategy and tactics of their presentation at the hearings. In Washington and New York, I conferred with newspapers and press services that covered the case. Our work for the bank was not only devoted to this case. After the SEC concluded its hearings in Washington, we concentrated on building goodwill for the bank and branch banking in the U.S. Since the first meeting with AP, I had felt that goodwill for the bank depended to a great extent on the attitudes toward branch banking. But by this time, the issue of branch banking had become so controversial that I urged the Bank of America to proceed on a campaign to validate this kind of banking. Branch banking was successful in New Zealand, Australia, Canada, England, and other countries, where it was an accepted method of banking. I felt that if we reflected its advantages to the people of this country, the standing of the Bank of America would be strengthened. I learned that J.W. Chapman, professor of banking at Columbia, favored branch banking and suggested the bank engage him as a consultant. He gathered a group of like-minded academic experts and formed a committee to further branch banking. It published a branch banking bibliography, pamphlets in many aspects of branch banking, releases, and other data. Harper's published a book on branch banking, written by committee members, which was widely distributed and received much favorable attention. This campaign, which always linked Dr. Chapman, committee chairman, with the Bank of America, cleared the atmosphere of ignorance and doubts, and improved the position of branch banking in the United States, and with it, that of the Bank of America. In addition to the activities already begun, I recommended that a survey be made to learn what Californians thought of the bank. Braun and Company of California made the survey and found that the Bank of America had poor relations with its depositors, its communities, and other publics on which it depended. The survey confirmed what I had thought, that the bank badly needed an overall job of public relations covering basic management policies and practices. The reputation of the bank was no better than that of most California banks, and in most cases worse. The bank's reputation was particularly poor in the area of its landlord relationships. Important publics were antagonistic to the bank. Basic changes in policies and practices were needed at the top, and afterward there was still the problem of getting them accepted by personnel and by the public. I suggested that the antipathy to bigness might be minimized by encouraging initiative and a human, personal relationship between the bank's employees and the public. In addition, to validate bigness, good reasons should be given to the public explaining why a large bank served their interests better than a small one. If people understood that bigness could be beneficial as well as malevolent, the bank's cause would be served. In another approach, I urged bank managers to participate in community activities to develop favorable opinion for their local branches. When World War II came, America recognized the importance and value of bigness in its industrial machinery, and after the war, public opinion favored big corporations. During World War II, Many clients indicated deep concern about their adjustment to the peacetime that would follow the war. They felt they might be left behind in the rapid changes that would result. Among those I advised on post-war adjustments were the American Nurses Association, the U.S. Beet Sugar Association, the National Association of Glue Manufacturers, the Pharmaceutical Profession and Industry, the American Optometric Association, and the Franklin Institute of Philadelphia. Strangely enough, Although their services or goods were different, their problems were the same. Therefore, our approach to them followed a pattern. First, finding the facts, 
then interpreting them and making recommendations for action to lead to better adjustment with the public. When I started my four years of publicizing Mack trucks, I was sure I would be busily engaged in promoting motor vehicles. I was, but by the most indirect kind of indirection. Actually, I was propagandizing for a huge road-building program for the United States. I saw my ideas gain strength by chain reaction and translate themselves into a gargantuan reality, a dramatic demonstration of how private interest and public interest coincide in our society. To my surprise, the effort resulted in a $23 billion United States road-building program authorized by the Congress. Mack trucks had manufactured trucks for 50 years. The bulldog trademark symbolized size, sturdiness, durability. Truck men, owners, and drivers preferred Mack trucks. In 1949, new management had taken over. E. L. Bransom, the new president, and H. W. Dodge, the executive vice president, dominated the corporation. Bransom had the personality of a bulldog. Bransom was built like a bulldog, too, held on tenaciously like a bulldog, and barked even more viciously than a bulldog. He had undoubtedly chosen H. W. Dodge, his right-hand man, as compensation for his own inadequacies. I had often observed this practice in business. Dodge had the gentlest of personalities. He was charming, courteous, thoughtful, and besides, was a splendid executive. Between the super-aggressiveness of Bransom and the gentle drive of Dodge, the company made headway. But Mack trucks faced grave problems. The United States transportation system was the second largest industry in the country, grown to its huge size without planning. The United States had one-third of the world's railroad mileage, one-third of its surfaced roads, 70% of its motor vehicles. Trucks had recently advanced rapidly in number, and were already carrying 69% of the livestock transported, 50% of the fruits and vegetables, and 97% of the live poultry. The railroad share of freight had dropped from 78% in 1929 to 60% in 1949, due to the inroad of trucks. In desperation, the railroads had decided to eliminate this most frightening competitor, the large truck. With the assistance of professional propagandists, they had started a vigorous anti-truck propaganda, and were making an impact on the public. They carried their line to the public in many ways, notably by publication in magazines of horrendous tales about large trucks. The Saturday Evening Post, in September 1950, ran an article saying trucks destroyed our highways. The Reader's Digest published an article, All the Railroads Want is a Fair Deal. The principal accusations against large trucks were that they were a menace on the roads and to the roads, that they did not pay their share of taxes for road building and maintenance, and that their loads were over the legal weight. I made an analysis of this propaganda and found that it aimed to isolate heavy trucks from other trucking in the public mind before attempting to legislate them out of existence. It made heavy trucks scapegoats for the private automobilists' frustration at having to cope with traffic on the highways. It tried to align private motorists with the railroad's efforts to penalize heavy trucks. As a result, Mack suffered both from state laws that penalized its trucks and from public revulsion, stimulated by the propaganda. Bransom, Dodge, and I realized in our discussions that Mack's markets would become more and more limited unless a countervailing force was brought into action. If heavy trucking and Mack were to serve the economic purposes of a nation and survive, a solution would have to be found. But obviously no immediate solution was possible. Our population was growing, so was the number of passenger and truck automobiles. The static element was the highway system of the country. An idea hit me. Since no present solution was possible, maybe a future solution would assuage the frustrations of the public. If we could promise American motorists future satisfaction on their roads and work to bring that about, the gripe against heavy trucks would be dissipated, and tomorrow the problem would be solved. McAdam, the great English road builder in the 19th century, had said, We must build roads for the traffic and not traffic for the roads. The attack on heavy trucks could be minimized if our campaign for more highways for the future was successful. Ransom, quick on the trigger when an idea pleased him, wanted full-scale action immediately. For him, the plan was one of avoiding a shoehorn road policy. Let us not squeeze the traffic to fit the roads, but build the roads to carry the traffic. I started by hiring a hall, 
the most newsworthy one in New York outside of Madison Square Garden, the Waldorf Astoria Grand Ballroom. The New York Board of Trade sponsored a lunch at which Bransom, the only speaker, made his proposal for an extended road-building program. Transportation in a time of crisis. Tycoons and the press, Max guests, filled the room. The Korean War was on, which helped the idea spread its wings. We must learn to build our way out of traffic jams. We must learn to build roads, forgive this plug, that are built like a Mac. The New York Herald Tribune the next day reported, The answer to trucks on the road and to the fact that overloading trucks breaks up highways is not found in legislation that will curtail the use of trucks, but in a road-building program that will give this nation better roads than now exist. And noted that Bransom lashed out at the attacks on the trucking industry as unwarranted and distorted. No industry has the right to tear down another industry through vicious and unbridled propaganda and lobbying, he said. I was soon running a lecture bureau with Bransom, Dodge, and other company officials as stars, barnstorming the country with carefully prepared orations on the necessity for a highway system for the future to meet the country's needs. The idea snowballed as groups and organizations with a public or private interest in furthering the idea carried it forward enthusiastically. It developed speedy nationwide momentum. The large tire companies promoted the idea in huge advertisements, plugging for more and better roads. The American Road Builders Association, with a membership of manufacturing companies that made road building materials, got on the bandwagon and pushed the program. Communities suffering from road thrombosis took up the cry. The Hearst newspapers throughout the country demanded of Congress an expanded and integrated road building program to serve the needs of our country. Congress responded to the hue and cry and the call of public opinion and passed the largest road building program in the history of the nation. Public recognition of roads and highways was heightened by the Korean crisis. National security rested on trucks, and large truckers filled a national need. Bransom's aggressiveness, much as I disliked it, along with Dodge's charm and a good idea, building highways for the future, had helped America get the road system it needed then. Today I have second thoughts about road construction and the forces that are trying to accelerate it, and am trying as best I can to reverse the trend and save open spaces from encroachment by unneeded highways. In the last two decades, many clients came to us from business and finance, labor unions, trade and professional organizations, and as individuals. We gave them the best professional advice we could, and at the same time we advised gratis many causes concerned with advancing this society. The use of professional public relations counsel was penetrating more deeply into the fabric of American society. A listing of a few of our clients of this period demonstrates this. A huge complex of companies made up of many subsidiaries retained us to advise them on problems of their relations with their multiple publics. A symphony orchestra had alienated thousands of its supporters when program notes had maligned their ethnic background. We were asked for advice on how to counteract this error. Years ago, the management would have swallowed hard and hoped for time to cure it. A large bank, which would have felt self-sufficient a decade before, asked us to counsel them on how to meet their competition. A textile manufacturer in a New England state, aware of the low morale of his community due to the moving away of a large business, retained us to make recommendations on how to improve the city's morale. A financial institution asked for aid in warding off a rapacious stockholder group that aimed at a takeover. Years before, the defensive and counteroffensive would have been left in the hands of the lawyers. An investment council firm retained us. A public health authority in favor of group medicine decided that public relations was the only way to make headway with unions and other groups. Professional groups like the Joint Council of New York State Psychologists and American Optometric Associations asked us to protect their professional status. Labor unions, which had been the victim of public relations activities of employers, now used counsel on public relations. The International Union of Electrical Workers retained me as an expert on propaganda analysis in a case before the National Labor Relations Board. This involved the limits to which an employer could go in communicating with his own employees. The decision set a precedent. The General Electric Company was held guilty by the trial examiner and the board of what my study of the company publications revealed. That is, that the company aimed to break down the trust of union members in their president, James Carey and the Brotherhood of Railroad Trainmen, with its membership of 180,000, 
retained us to advise on a counteroffensive against a smear of the Association of American Railroads that they and members of the other railroad operating unions were feather bedders. There were always new clients and new problems, as there are today. End of Biography of an Idea Memoirs of Public Relations Counsel Edward L. Bernays Narrated by Merwin Smith This recording may not be reproduced without permission of the copyright owner, Newstrack Incorporated. Thank <laughs> you.